Okay, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, um, can you hear me? <laughs> Checking. Testing. Can you see him hear me? Yeah. Okay, welcome to Stampscaping 101, the live broadcast. This is my first one, so you'll have to kind of bear with me. I hope everyone's getting this good. Um, I've set up <laughs> uh, all of my equipment, as far as I can tell uh, correctly, and I think that the resolution and sound quality is going to have to do with my upload speed as well as everyone's download speed, so I hope everyone's getting that. But anyways... Um, I haven't done a live uh, demo in a really long time, so you'll have to bear with me, but I think with this technology here, it's really a good opportunity to uh, do some uh, live action types of things and uh, to answer anyone's questions. So thank you to YouTube for having this uh, kind of platform uh, that's there for everyone. So anyways... Um, Everyone's all in different places with um, scenic stamping. Some people have done it before. Some people are brand new to it. And um, what I thought I would do, it's I could do anything that you guys want me to do. If you, there's any specific request, just post it. But what I thought I would do in the beginning here is just what I used to do as an introduction to the entire line. Okay, So I'll just work through some compositions first. And I thought I would do that with some of the sets. Um, set number six, set number seven here, and set number eight were the first um, set designs that I did, okay? Or the first set groupings that I did. And the reason for that was I put some of our key images in each one of the sets and I based it around three of some of the most popular images. Okay, this one's based around the Lakeside Cove, Lakeside Cabin, and the Country Chapel. Okay, now what makes these three sets key in terms of kind of the basics and scenic stamping is not the main image in each one of these, but it's the filler image that goes around it. So things like the clouds here really provide a nice background to any scene that you might want to do. You can use it in desert, tropical, you know, forest, pine forest. You can use it in any scene, so it makes for a good universal background. Uh, foreground images, things like this um, oak branch, um, can be used as an overhanging branch. It could be used as bushes in the bottom part. The water pattern stamp right here is a good filler stamp for any kind of water scene. And this foreground tree stamp can be used um, to go along with its sibling image, the Lakeside Cove Large. But it can also be used by itself 
in its entirety. It can be used just for the trees. And you'll see that as a common theme for all of the images that I have. I want to make these images as universal as possible. So even with the Lakeside Cove scene here, if you didn't color in the reflections, and let's say you use some grass down here, this could easily be a grassy terrain um, in front of, or as a setting for this row of rocks and trees in the background. So that's why this type of uh, um, set was put together. Um, same thing with this one right here. This one also has the water pattern, but it also has the row of trees in the background. This rocky um, ledge stamp can also be used as a really good foreground. You can make a big mountain with it if you want to just by stacking it. The reed stamp is a, one of my favorites as a good um, universal foreground type of images uh, image. And that's because it's real spindly. You can put that as a, something that's really close to the viewer, but it's still kind of uh, airy enough where you're not blocking off the background. Okay? And the same type of thing goes for this tree here. It's a lone pine tree. And then what we have is the country chapel set. It's a good kind of foundation for um, any type of land terrestrial thing. I use that sedge filler stamp that comes in this set all the time. And uh, let's see, the rocky peaks in the background, that, that's a really fantastic um, background if you don't want something, or if you want something in between something like your subject matter and just sky or something like that. It's kind of, it, I don't know, in a, in a sense it becomes a mid-ground stamp if you're talking about sky, mountains, and the uh, chapel and all of the other uh, imagery that goes with it. So anyways, um, I thought I would do some compositions using these three set, and let me open this one here. These sets here come in unmounted as well as the cling foam versions. Now, I, didn't, I couldn't find my cling foam version of the uh, Lakeside Cove, so I'm just using the mounted version. If you're using... Uh, the unmounted versions, then you'll want to get acrylic blocks and uh, apply something like a tack and peel on it. There's some other types of uh, materials out there that you uh, can place on your directly to your rubber that makes for a nice uh, temporary mounting system. I happen to like the tack and peel a lot, and I've done videos on this material before, but it's this little kind of, I don't know what it is, it's this tacky rubber uh, surface that has a permanent adhesive on one side, but it's just that kind of cling, you know, clingy type of uh, tackiness material on the other side, okay? And it makes for a great um, surface here because even if it gets kind of uh, coated in dust over time or whatever and it becomes less tacky, you just rinse it off in the uh, sink and it, it's as tacky as ever. In fact, it's really sticky, so be sure and if you get this, keep that uh, Kind of that uh, protective plastic thing to go over the top of it, you know, because if you just put a piece of paper down on it, it's, you know, it's stuck like iron on there. All right, so that being said, let's get into some compositions right here. If you're a viewer of this channel, you might have seen some of these types of videos that I call stamp sketching, and it's really for people that are new to scenic stamping and um, if you're especially if you're coming from kind of a foundation of using a lot of images that are outlines you know where you're doing careful masking stamp positioning um, stamping of images and coloring in i find that kind of the spirit of scenic stamping it's a lot looser in terms of um, those compositional builds okay now, I'm just going to be stamping on some glossy cardstock, and I'm going to be using dye-based inks. But Stampscapes is not a technique, okay? It's just a system of interlocking designs that can be used in conjunction with the sibling designs. Um, they can be used in repetition. You can use them multiple times for larger compositions by just stamping the same object over and over again. And, like I said, they can be used in part. Like I said, if I don't color in this bottom 
area here where it has those reflections, then it can become a meadow. Or if I just wanted those trees in there, you know, behind, uh, you know, or in front of, like, say, like a mountain like this one, I can just color in the trees and use it that way. So anyways, that all being said again, I originally came up with this concept of these landscape stamps, these modular stamps, for the purpose of being backgrounds for other imagery. It could be other images that were from um, a stamp of the hand, this company that I used to work for, and they could be used as backgrounds for other company stamps. You know? So one of the things that I like to do a lot is um, I take stamps from other companies and I might do a setting for it. So it's almost like you're kind of creating a stage for something, the star of the scene, you know, so it might be, uh, I don't know, uh, something as simple as like a snail in the foreground or something like that. I happen to like a lot of old engravings, those 19th century engravings, you know, that are kind of in those Dover books because I like the tight detail and I think it pairs well with the detailed images that we have, okay? But you can use just about anything. These could be settings for your word stamp. It could be a happy birthday stamp or something like that. So that's why I tried to make them as universal as possible because, you know, the original concept was, you know, settings for other things, okay? And that was back in, why, it was back in like 1990 or 89 or something like that, so. Um, I didn't even stamp at the time. I was just uh, working at a stamp in a hand, and uh, they would have a call for images once in a while. Okay, so this is two impressions with the Lakeside Cove Large. Now, here's the biggest thing between um, a lot of types of stamping and scenic stamping, not just stampscape stamps, but a lot of people just aren't used to the idea of taking a stamp inking it up again and stamping it right over the top of their previous impression, right? That's like the absolute worst thing that you can do with an outline image is because you don't want a bunch of, you know, outlines showing up in other imagery. You want things to seem like it's in front of one another or in back of it. You want it positioned just right. And that's because we're doing a lot of um, interior coloring of these um, compositions that we're making with outline design. So that's, you know, the biggest thing that you see when you go into a class or something like that, or a demonstration where people haven't seen it before. They're like, oh my god, you know, it, you didn't use a stamp positioner or a, uh, a masking film or something like that. You know, you can just overlap everything. So in a workshop situation where it's the first time they've ever done it, it's kind of a liberating um, type of feeling for a lot of people. Okay, now let's see here. Um, let's add in some other filler stamps. And let's go with some of this water pattern stamp. Okay, it's just texture. And in water scenes, a lot of times, I like to unify um, that area down below with some additional texture. Now, I would usually do this in a blue or whatever color out of my color scheme I'm working in. So if this is a sunset scene with a lot of golden oranges, yellows, reds, or something like that, I would stamp out those reflections in that color, okay? Because these patterns right here are um, kind of reflective of kind of the shaded area within a given texture. In this case, it's a, um, you know, a body of water. So if you're making your water blue, chances are, you know, the shadows would be blue. And I say that because a lot of times people think, um, and you can do this, okay? You can just stamp this out in black. Because a lot of times people are thinking of shadows, they're thinking of shadows being black, all right? And I, like I said, it, you can do that, but like on this pad right here, um, this pad is a given blue, but you can see on the shadowed side, it's a darker version of it, right? So that's 
you know, my concept of that type of thing. All right, so with a texture stamp, I don't look at it like the building of, or the stacking of like a bunch of bricks, okay? With landscape stamping, you don't want to look at it as kind of like a puzzle where everything is meant to be um, layered edge to edge, okay? You want things to kind of overlap, and that's what kind of creates that seamless aspect of your entire composition, okay? So, we have that blue in there, and let's see here. Let's mix and match, okay? This um, Lakeside Cove comes out of the Nature scene, uh, set number eight. And let's just take these pine trees here, and let's take those, and let's put another row of trees in the background here, okay? Now I can do that in a variety of different um, tones, but let's play around with um, value a little bit, okay? Now this is where I'm kind of staying with this theme of um, kind of the difference between um, scenic stamping and, I don't know what you would call it, uh, <clears throat> kind of more traditional stamping, I guess, or whatever. I mean, this is traditional too, but um, outline stamps, okay? Now here's the thing. If I take, now I just ink this up, uh, this is the pine row, I just inked it up in black. But now, if I stamp it right here in the background, it's going to have the same value as that row of trees, right? So one of the things you can easily do, I could stamp it out in a gray or something like that, but you can also just, for ease sake, you can kind of blot that off and go for a second impression. But one of the things that I like to do to create a little bit more atmosphere, and if you've watched uh, any of the videos that I do, there is kind of this, I'm going for kind of atmosphere in the scene, so I like to kind of create this misty kind of uh, transitions, you know, within the imagery. So what I like to do here is I'm going to take this, now remember I've blotted it off once, so it's inherently lighter, but what I'm doing here on the bottom of this pine rose stamp is I'm taking off some of the ink, and I'm taking off a pretty good amount, and going up about midway up the design, okay, I've taken off, you know, a decent amount, I've taken off a lot down here, decent amount here, and less here. So what we're doing is we're kind of creating this transition of dry to wet. You know, it's not real wet up there, but when I stamp this out now, we should, or what I'm going for is I'm going for that transition of value right here. Okay, so we can still see that row of trees in here and it's still defined, but we have those trees in the background that are reasonab uh, reasonably defined as well. Okay, now let's do that maybe one more time over here. And again, no masking was necessary, right? And that's, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I do everything for the purpose of kind of avoiding masking, but I think as, ge as a general type of uh, process. I try to keep things as simple as possible uh, for myself because I'm not, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I want to avoid kind of tedium and just keep things as fluid as possible. Okay. Now this one I took off a little bit more ink because I thought eh, I could have taken off a little bit more over here to keep that row in the foreground a little bit more defined, but um, anyway. This one's taken off a little bit more, okay? So it's working from dry to moist up here. And it's just a simple matter of taking a dry paper towel and wiping it off down here. Don't take a wet paper towel and do that, otherwise you're going to be taking off everything. So we just want to make it lighter in there, okay? So no masking, which is a good, a good thing. <clears throat> you could mask if you want to. <laughs> That's what I used to say in my workshops sometimes. Sometimes people, I'd hear people saying, oh, I 
you know, it's, you know, they feel it's kind of strange positioning this type of thing without a positioner. I'd tell them, uh, well, you could use a positioner if you want to, and they say, no, that's all right. Okay, foreground. This is the reeds stamp right here. And now normally I would like to finish this off with some color first, and then a lot of times I like to keep my foreground for the last thing that I do. But in working with these compositions right now, you know, that's a good foundation for a composition. You can also put, you know, some kind of subject matter, matter in there, someone on the canoe, wildlife, whatever, okay? But here's the thing if you're adding in some sort of subject matter into the scene, okay? Now, a lot of times when people are new to scenic stamping, um, they might be thinking about, what can I add in here? <clears throat> if they're going to add in something like a figure, like a little fisherman or something like that, or a canoeist, you don't want to place, like, or like this little eagle right here, okay? You wouldn't want to place them or position them in a, uh, in a spot where there's a lot of dark background already in there because they're not going to show up. There's just too much busy uh, subject matter already in the scene. So you'll want to position it somewhere where it's light enough. Now, if I stamp like a fisherman or a person on a canoe in here in this uh, body of water and do it in black, it'll show up just fine, okay? But like this eagle or something in the sky, some ducks maybe flying around in here, they would have to be done in a space where you, re you reserve some open area for it. So it's like you're kind of, again, it's like you're kind of creating a stage or you're staging for whatever subject matter you have. So kind of leave an open spot for that, okay? All right, now let's look at some other compositions and uh, let's stay with the spirit of um, stamp sketching. And again, stamp sketching is a really good way to go into it. It's, you know, we're not worried about color schemes or anything like that at this point in time. We're just kind of getting the, uh, the feel of the new imagery that we've had, or if you're new to scenic stamping, you're getting kind of comfortable with this notion of overlapping and blending, of the blending of the imagery, okay? All right, let's try something with the Lakeside Cabin stamp. If you've just joined in, welcome to the uh, live broadcast. Um, I happen to mention that we're stamping in dye-based inks, and I have my glossy cardstock. Now, there's a lot of questions on things like um, media, okay? And naturally so, but I always tell people, again, that Stampscapes is not a... a bit larger color block for this one. It's not a medium, I mean, or a technique. It's uh, just a grouping of stamps that can be used with one another form scenes and compositions in a seamless fashion, okay? Now, if I wanted to do something like colored pencil, then you're, you're going to want to stamp and do your compositions on a matte paper or something more conducive to the medium that you're using. So like colored pencils, chalks, pastels, that type of media, soft media, is going to make, you know, requires a paper with a bit more tooth to it, okay? Like a, a matte paper or something, I don't know if I would stamp like a really detailed scene on something like a really um, textured watercolor paper because like a lot of this detail just won't show up because there's so many pits and grooves in a paper like that. But a matte paper would do just, you know, fine. And you can see a lot of um, different examples of scenes on our uh, website. Okay. Oh, let's go with something like this. Now, with things like bodies of water and whatnot, you can stamp these in a landscape configuration. You can go um, portrait. And where you place that, you know, is just, you know, up to you. There's no right or wrong to this. If you want more water, then stamp it up higher. If you want more sky or whatever is going to be in the background, then just stamp it lower. Sometimes it's fun to go kind of more dramatic and stamp your scene all the way at the top of the uh, scene and have that whole area down here as a body of water. Or if you're going for something like sky, let's say you have a 
quote stamp or something like that on stars, then you can stamp this really far down like that. Or you can stamp it right in the middle and have the sky reflected in the sky as well as the water. So that's one of the, you know, the beauties of a water stamp, or so this Lakeside Cove stamp right here. Sometimes you can make a body of water or a scene of a lake all about the sky. I could stamp this way up here, but the sky can be shown as a reflection in the water. So it makes it a little bit more dramatic and maybe something a little bit more unexpected, you know, um, in terms of the compositional build. Okay, that was the lakeside cabin. Let's put in some foreground here. Okay, Randy. <laughs> hey, my first question of a live broadcast. The kind of paper that I'm using is, it's called King James Cast Coat, okay? It's not available anymore, all right? But on my paper test video, and I'll say it here too, it's Chrome Coat that you can use. And I did a, I did a test on Chrome Coat recently uh, just to make sure that, you know, when I recommend a certain thing, it's going to work. And Chrome Coat works beautifully. And Chrome Coat is spelled with a K-R-O-M-E-K-O-T-E. -E. And you can find it in various locations. If you just look it up on, you know, if you do a web search, you can find it. And Chrome Coat's been around for a very long time. It's the paper that I started stamping with, uh, you know, when I started uh, actually stamping. I was, I kind of designed stamps for a stamp in a hand before that. But uh, when I came out with the landscape, series, um, the people that used to demonstrate at the shows said, all right, Kevin, we don't know what to do with that. Uh, K-R-O-M-E-K-O-T-E, -E, no H in there. And I don't know, you see it everywhere, but um, it, now there's a lot of companies that sell their own or package their own glossy paper too. And it's usually sold in sheets of 10, I think. Now, I don't know what type of paper that is, but it's been repackaged, so if you don't want a set of, that's correct, one word. <laughs> um, it, uh, what was I talking about? Um, it comes in sets of like 10 whole sheets. If you buy chrome coat, in an entire ream. I believe it's a ream of 200. Yeah, Marcos is a really great place to uh, to pick that up. And Marcos is one of those places that caters to the stamping public, so they're going to know what papers work really well with your, uh, you know, for your, your crafting purposes. Okay, now we have the legend here, and you can see where I've overlapped it. Uh, to form one complete ledge. You can have an 11 by 17 paper and you can kind of create this whole big area of that um, ledge right there. And I've done a demonstration of that before in another video. Maybe I'll do it here too. Um, but let's do something here. Let's do some um, colors in the background. I don't know about UPO paper. If anyone else knows about UPO paper that's here on the chat, maybe you can... Uh, chime in there on that live chat. Yeah, by the way, you can ask each other things too. A lot of you know a lot more about media and where to find it than I do. Um, I tend to use certain things for a, a really long time. Okay, I'm doing that wiping off type of thing here. Now here's where I am going to do a little bit of masking, okay? See that cabin stamp right there? There's an open top to it, okay? It's that rooftop that I don't want to have a bunch of trees in, okay? But this is the extent of 95% of my masking that I ever do, maybe 99%. I just have to cover that up. You don't have to cover up black solid trees, okay, when you're masking. That's why I kind of design a lot of images this way, to save me and you the time of having to do a lot of that more kind of tedious work. Uh, yeah, the paper mill store is really fantastic for uh, papers, and I've referred people to them uh, numerous times. 
The paper mill is also the one that are selling it on Amazon, I believe. Okay. And a pack of 200 will really last you quite a long time. Okay, I'm gonna do another one back here. It looks weird like that, you know, just green, because I don't have all the other colors, you know, layered and blended onto this thing, so. That's why it's going to look that, uh, that way. Let me wipe off some of this bottom part here. Uh, Memento inks work really good. I love Memento inks. Um, I don't know about the Memento black for me, though. Um, with my black pads, I like something that's going to be really dark. Okay, now I do use Memento, you know. Here they are right here, plus some more. Okay, I love those colors. I love to blend memento colors down onto my scene. And uh, distress inks. There isn't any pad that I don't like. And uh, one of the things I mentioned recently in another video is, you know those little tiny little cube uh, stamp pads? I don't really like that type of format because I, I use a lot of ink. So I don't want something really tiny like that, okay? Those are good for some other images, like smaller outline image, where you're not going to need a lot of ink. Okay, so that has been placed down here. Now let me go back to this other water pattern stamp. Maybe I'll finish this one off right here with some uh, additional tone. Let me just go ahead and hit, why don't I use that memento? Let's use Summer Sky right here. Uh, here's a question for you, uh, all of you out there, if you feel inclined to answer, but uh, one of the things that I asked in a workshop one time was, uh, oh no, I don't know, I probably asked it more than once, but um, what is your favorite black pad? Or do you have one? That is Memento Summer Sky. Now let's go to the Memento Bahama Blue, okay? Now my favorite black pad is the Marvy one. Versafine is fantastic, too. Versafine is insanely um, black, all right? Now one of the things for me where I live is I just don't know how long that Versafine is going to take to kind of set up for me on glossy cardstock. Now I could probably heat set it or something like that. Okay, now I'm going with this Bahama Blue because I like to create kind of this transition of value in all of my given areas within a scene. So you can do that with textures as well, okay? So just because you're stamping out some kind of texture stamp doesn't mean you only have to do it in one color. I like to do it in two values, sometimes three, depending on how dark it gets out there, okay? So if I can inherently get darker with the image itself, but just by stamping it in a darker version, a lot of times I do it that way, and that'll give me a little bit of a head start when I start the toning process here. Um, archival blacks are good. Stays on black is really good too. I haven't used a lot of stays on before. Um, just because I'm kind of lazy and I don't want to be um, cleaning my stamps like in a hurry right after I use them. But, um, you know, I mean, those kind of uh, watercolor type pads um, uh, stays on, those permanent styles of pads. I mean, if you want something, if you want to use something where you just absolutely know it's not going to smear then you can do something like that. Now, I don't really get a lot of smearing with that Marvy ink. I feel that it sets up in a decent amount of time where I'm not sitting around waiting for too long, okay? All right, so we have some stamp, we have a couple stamp sketches right here. And let's just kind of start finishing this off right now, okay? Uh, let's go, someone mentioned uh, the Memento. Let's try these right now, okay? Now here's my, um, technique right here. I usually go with thicker inks, which in my experience are just about every kind of ink brand out there except for Marvy, okay? So just about any inks 
can be used as your first color. Typically, I like to start light though, and that's why in the past I've used a lot of the shadow stamping Adirondack light pads. But mementos are really good too. They're really, like this one right here, it's really um, super light in value. Okay, now someone mentioned that they're Marvy Black smeared, okay? Now chances are, if you have a brand new pad, if you just got it, um, it could smear because you're going to be applying a lot of ink over to it. So um, when you're doing that, when you're inking something, what happened to my black pad? If I could zoom out, I would show you my desk, but I think you know, all of you know what I'm talking about. As soon as you do like one scene, you know, you can have a completely clear desk and then it's a big pile of clutter after that. When you're looking for something that's right in front of you. Okay, but when you're inking something up, um, like with this Marvy pad right here, just be sure and do small dabs like this and do it very lightly, okay? And if it's really super juicy, you can even just kind of do a little bit of this drag motion like that. Because what's happening is if you're using a really super wet pad, and if you're squeezing it down too hard, or, you know, you might not even be doing that, you might just be tapping it lightly. One of the things that could be doing it is it could be puddling up in the tighter details, which a lot of stamps have in this series, okay? There's a lot of tight detail. So if you're using super, you know, brand new pads like a Versafine could potentially do that, or a Memories Black that are really thick, um, just be careful of that. Or you can kind of do that little drag thing at the end of it. So when you're, what you're doing is you're building up these little microscopic, you know, beads of, well, not, not microscopic, but these beads of uh, ink onto the rubber surface. So if it builds up too much, what you might want to do is just kind of drag your stamp a little bit so that it's wiping off some of that ink back into the pad. Okay, so here's the, now here's my Marvy inks. Now, I mean, it's been probably, I don't know how long since I stamped that out, five minutes or something like that. This is the Memories Summer Sky, and you can see it's a very, very light value of blue, okay? Now, I like that just as a initial color, lighter colors, because when I'm doing this type of thing right here, and I'll talk about lighting schemes for you guys too, but one of the things that, okay, here, let me back up a little bit. What do we have right here? We have basically kind of the sky area, okay? I mean, there's trees in the foreground, but we have sky, water, and rocks, all right? And here, it's kind of the same thing, sky in the background, water down here. One of the things that I get a lot of questions about, um, not really in a beginning class because we're just working on compositions and blending things together in a nice seamless fashion. And I teach people how to kind of put together their color schemes. And I just did that with this one. I was just talking about, you know, light, medium, and dark. Now I can use other things like in that cabin right there. Maybe that cabin's going to be brown or something like that. <laughs> it's really, my color schemes and lighting schemes are really, really easy. When people look at a scene like this, if they haven't seen it done before and they haven't done that type of thing, it can be, you know, the notion of it could look more complex than it really is. Just because, you know, they haven't done that type of thing. Most of the times when people are stamping things out, when they're a beginning stamper, they're coloring in really definitive areas within a kind of an image that's an outline, okay? And I'm talking about for beginning stampers, not people, you know, you guys are doing like collages and all these things, multimedia and mixed media and whatnot, okay? But, for the beginning stamper, you know, someone that's been doing uh, certain types of imagery, you know, the notion of a finished scenic uh, composition, where do you start, what images were used, um, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it can be quite confusing because they don't even know how many stamps you use because it's hard to tell where one stamp ended and the other one began. A lot of people think that, it, you know, when you do a scene like this and you can't see all the scenes in there, right? They can think it's like one stamp sometimes. But then they think, but then they think, well, how did you get all the colors in there? So, 
If you break it down like this, though, super easy, okay? Now, here's the thing now with lighting, okay? A lot of people have trouble with lighting, and the only reason for that is is because they don't leave light areas, okay? They've kind of gone over everything. So here's my thing. I just kind of keep a little bit of a light area in each one of my zones, okay, or each one of my subject matters. Okay, in this case, it's a cabin. I'm going to leave some, you know, light areas within that space, okay? And with this super light color like this, they didn't used to have really light colors like this um, when dye based inks came out. You know, they were all kind of the basic ones, you know, you were looking at something like this. They were all super bright and, uh, you know, kind of a medium tone and on. There was a few light colors, but people were stamping out images, okay? in pads, so you wouldn't have something like this summer sky because if you stamped it out, something out, anything in that, you wouldn't even be able to see it. Uh, someone had a question on, um, Dana, I haven't used Distress Oxides before. Has anyone used that? Can anyone answer that? Uh, is that that's Tim Holtz, right? Is, are Distress Oxides, are they dye-based inks? Or are they something else? And... I use Distress inks all the time, but they're not the oxide ones. They're just your dye-based ones, okay? I'm going to have to look into those oxides at some point in time. Or, do any of you have Copic markers out there, and are you using that on... What's the name of that paper that people use for that? Cryogen paper or something like that? Another great look, you know, with um, scenic uh, um, stamping. Okay, but here's the, um, oh, the Dressage Oxide's dye-based. Oh, wow. I don't know, sounds interesting. I'm going to gonna have to try it. Or if any of you try it, let me know how it works out. Okay, but here's your lighting, okay? And it's really faint lighting at this time because I haven't taken the Aries and made it darker, okay? So the thing about this is just retain those lighter areas on here when you go to the darker tones, okay? So here's what I used to do um, in my workshops. You'd get people kind of in tune with the feel of applying inks in this motion, okay? I usually start on the outside edge and then I work my way in, okay? I don't use too much of like this type of motion right here, okay? Because pe that's when people start getting the shapes of their applicators showing up everywhere, all right? But here's the thing, though. Um, when you start doing this, you start kind of, you know, creating some muscle memory. And it's a very short time, you know, in a workshop situation. People are, you know, working one color through the next. But the thing is, is when you move into your next color, you just use it a little bit more sparingly, okay? And don't go in quite as far as you did with your previous color. Now that's, you know, you don't have to take a, a ruler and measure it and say, oh my gosh, I went all the way to the white with that stroke. You know, that's okay. But just in general, that's, you know, the general concept of it, okay? And one of the things, going back to Memento, I really like Memento inks because they really glide onto the paper beautifully. They're thick, okay? But here's the thing, though. I would use just that ink, um, unless there, you know, there was another color in Marvy or something that, that I, like, I like better, you know, so I would use that. But as far as the ink application kind of texture of the, uh, or viscosity of the uh, inks, this is really beautiful. It, it, blends beautifully. You can really spread it around. This is the thing that um, mementos are good for. Let me just show it to you in this um, medium tone because you can see it easier. But if I go like that, it really gives me time to kind of spread it out, okay? Now I see some imagery down there from those initial impressions, but I can kind of keep blending that in. But see this right here? It really spreads out like this. Like that really nicely. Now a lot of times people are going for that value first, 
Okay, they want that value right off the bat, so they might be doing it with that memento summer sky, right, as your first color. But the thing is, it's a lighter color, so sometimes for people kind of might tear one of these foam pads is because they go down like this and start applying it, and if it's not dark enough already, then they use more pressure, you know, like that, and then, you know, it is foam rubber, and it can tear, but if you just use just a really light touch like this, okay, and get your color and value in repetition, it's as smooth as anything, okay, and this is, again, it's being done on glossy cardstock, so that's what the glossy cardstock is good for as far as this technique goes. You can use a matte one, but I would use a coated matte paper uh, in terms of this type of application. <clears throat> The matte ones just absorb your, your ink a little bit faster, so sometimes you can feel it grabbing, okay? If it's that, that's the case, then just kind of use a lighter touch and just stay in that area a little bit longer, okay? So I'm not using any pressure at all on this <clears throat> tip. And doing it that way, I mean, I've had tips that lasted I don't know, 15 years like that, and it's usually, they don't wear out, it's just that over time, <clears throat> inevitably, you know, these tips can get a little bit dry, okay? Thanks, Randy, for the compliment. I love stamping, as I'm sure all of you do. If you're watching this, okay. Uh, Memento inks here. Okay, now what I'm getting at too is um, the thing about thick inks like that, they spread beautifully, okay, and it's because <laughs> they're kind of thick. One of the, let me see if it happens right here. Going to my third color right here, if I start applying this. It might apply, okay. But this is <clears throat> this is this color right here, this incarnation of blue, okay. But now let's take this in here, and see as I start applying it here, it's basically a Bahama blue color, right? It's just not getting very much darker. Uh, you're welcome, Christine. Thanks for watching. I find that's good, too, because everyone can answer all these other questions, and if anyone has anything specific, I can do it on here. You know, there's a delay of this, uh, uh, video about 15 seconds, so, um, just know that. Okay, but see, as I'm going on here, it's, well, it's getting a little bit darker, but it only gets so dark, okay? Because all these inks start to build up the thicker styles of inks, the Ranger inks like Distress, I'm guessing the Distress Oxide, I'm guessing they're all the kind of the same binders that are in a certain brand of inks, okay? So if one dye-based ink from a certain company um, is a certain viscosity, then another... <clears throat> line of inks in that same company are probably going to have the same um, kind of texture to it and thickness of their inks, okay? They'll just be a different color, it's a different line, all right? So that's why I use, I like to use Marvies in conjunction with these types right here, and sometimes uh, there's certain brands of inks that kind of dry dull. I don't know, have any of you ever experienced that? Now, one of the things that I mentioned is that one of the great kind of equalizers of all different brands of inks in terms of the overall appearance of it after it dries is um, like an acrylic sealant or, or protective coating. Okay, Krylon has the crystal clear. Um, there's all kinds of art sealants. There's UV ones. I usually don't bother with the UV one, but you certainly can. I had a can of it that I used, a, but, you know... I don't really have a lot of my cards on display, so I'm not really worried about light fastness and fading. But anyways, what I'm getting at here is Marvy is a little bit of a thinner ink, okay? So that I can keep 
adding on to this value um, range by building up through the Marvy inks because they penetrate and they'll kind of set up and dry on this part. Okay, now see, remember how I couldn't get too much darker with this Danube blue. Let me go with, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, here's my number three blue. It's kind of the equivalent in Marvy inks. Let's see if this one will show up here, okay? It still spreads pretty good because I have that foundation of other tones, okay, underneath there. Okay. Now see that right there? It's a little bit darker than this, you know, these other corners, right? And it's because this ink is thinner. So it can kind of get past <clears throat> that suspended layer of hue on the card. But now where I like to use the thicker ones first, it's because when I add on these darker tones, they spread beautifully on my card. Now they spread okay on just a bare piece of paper like this, but you can see it's a little bit more See how that's kind of scratchy looking down there? It's kind of more textural. And it's because this thin ink, see it really, it, it doesn't really want to spread very easy, right? And that's because these inks are thick. Now I can do it, you know. I, you know, I've practiced certainly enough to be able to get a decent transition out of it, but it just requires more touch. But let me show you where I've added that other coating, even though this is dried up right now, over the top of this one. See, having that layer of memento underneath there, see how beautifully this darker Marvy kind of starts to spread on here as opposed to that, okay? So that's why I, I use different inks for their different purposes. Now Marvy discontinued these color-coded cases, but they still do sell their reinkers. I don't think they're manufacturing reinkers. I think just Mar Uchida of America probably has, you know, a thousand or eight hundred uh, reinkers of every given color still, because those pads really hold a lot of ink, so they probably didn't sell a lot of reinkers to begin with. They sold a lot of black probably on some of their main colors, but while they have those reinkers, uh, still in stock, you can buy those with um, your blank Marvy pads. I think it's just a clear case or something like that around it. Okay, but see how much darker that got? Okay, now one of my favorite colors, I don't know, it wasn't really before, but it's, I've always liked it, but I didn't always use it too much, is this Prussian blue. Okay. Now this, I don't, whatever this Prussian blue is made out of, it really, really penetrates. In fact, if you stamp anything out in Prussian blue, it, you'd be, uh, it'd be a good idea to clean off your stamp soon after. But I don't know what it is in it. It, it really stains, but I, I think that's the same, um, kind of, uh, I don't know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? So this is what bad, it's bad about doing it online. I can't think of these things, but um, it's the, whatever that, the composition is made out of, it's, that makes it penetrate this. It, it, I don't know, it stains your stamps where every other color just washes off fine even if you've had it drying there and sitting there for, you know, a year, but Prussian blue is something. It's not going to ruin your stamps or anything like that. It's just dye-based ink. Okay, let's give this a little bit of a horizon right here, okay? See this right here? We can't really tell where the sky, you know, ends and the land begins, which is fine, too. You can kind of keep it like that. It's somewhat poetic, too. But if I want to create some sort of horizon line on here, I just mask off with my 
blotter paper and just take this down here. And again, I just kind of take it in from the outside edge in like this. And I just start blending it in and we give ourselves a nice horizon line, okay? But again, we don't want this, you know, these types of shapes. So what you do is you just kind of stay in one area and then blend it in and it'll blend in just fine. Just take your time at it. It's the thing is that there's no real precarious type of uh, activity that I do at any given time on a scene, but um, it's where people rush something, okay? They're rushing it, and then all of their white is gone in here. All of their lighting is gone, okay? But if you just kind of take it incrementally and, you know, you just kind of work on a given area at any given time. Don't try to work on the whole thing at one time. Then, you know, people start getting these kind of these shapes everywhere. But see, what I do is I just kind of work that little zone right there, and I pull that color over there. Okay, now let's do something with this rock down here. We have all these universal tones running over everything. We have all those blues. But let's make this rock down here a little bit different in terms of tone, and let's start addressing that cabin in there, okay? Now here's the thing. Um, this is why, and this is what I did in my workshops when I used to teach live workshops. I haven't done that for a while. But whenever I, whenever someone wanted to um, move into a different color scheme for any given object or area, okay? <clears throat> I just said, and it, even before dye-based pads, we were using pens, I would have them pull out their pens, and I would say, okay, if something's going to be brown, grab all of your pens or all of your pads, and just see what you have in terms of the value range, and line them up from light to dark, okay? Now, if I didn't have that one right there, which is a pale orange, we have our memento, like that. And if I didn't have, like, this medium tone, it's number six brown from Marvy, and I had something like, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite distressing colors here, walnut stain. You can go desert sand, walnut stain, dark brown like that, right? Three different companies, three different lines, all dye-based inks, three different values of brown, okay? Now, there's no set amount. If you have two, then that's fine as well. Try it out, you know. Okay. But, that being said, if you have more than one color of a given hue, it just, it looks nice and rich. Okay, now this was just that blue here from um, Marvy, and I'm not sure if we can tell here, but I find that blue over here from Marvy to be much deeper and richer than this one right here that's just been used over white paper, okay? It looks kind of flat to me and not quite so rich. So even though that this darker color covered up those lighter tones, these are all transparent colors, so it's going to have that depth to it if you put those, you know, um, foundational layers of color down, okay? And you kind of build up from there. I don't know if that's going to be the case with every single, you know, hue and color scheme that you're going to be working with from, you know, pads from all these different color, uh, companies, but what I found, it generally does um, kind of uh, feel and look better as a result, you know, to work through these lighter tones. And plus, when you work through light to dark, you can kind of see these um, lighting schemes developing slowly as opposed to jumping into something really dark right off the bat. I know what you mean, Elaine. Elaine wishes she had more time to work on stamping. That being said, I, this is one of the things that I feel about rubber stamping. It's the one of the, it's the ultimate medium, I think, or one of those ultimate mediums for today's busy person in that in the time we get home from uh, work, you know, we have things to do, you got dinner to do, people have kids, you know, you got to get them taken care of and whatnot. In, even in rubber stamping, even if you have like an hour 
or something like that, or at half hour, um, you can create, you kind of create something from scratch and have a final result. In the time when you do all those things, eat dinner and go to bed, you can have a finished piece where if we're working in something like, uh, you know, not that I'm against anything, but I'm just saying if you're working on like an afghan or a needle point or something like that, if you want, you know, a finished piece of, uh, you know, crafting, you know, a handcrafted piece, then that's going to take you a little bit longer. So, I don't know. I think that's one of the things that uh, like people are into uh, uh, rubber stamping. It's, you know, you can work on a more extended project, but you can do something very quickly. One of the things about scenic stamping, it, a really fast um, application are braired backgrounds. I could go for this braired background in here and just stamp this entire composition over the top of it. I don't know if I would go with green trees unless the background was kind of had green in there. But um, okay, now I, what I've done is I've added that desert sand in that cabin, and to give a little bit of continuity to the scene, I've added some of that desert sand down here. But you can see by going really light. It blends into this area beautifully, even though it's tan amongst blue, okay? Now, see on my cabin right here, on horizontal surfaces, or a little bit more horizontal, it's a little bit slanted, I like to have my light reflecting on those types of things. But on the vertical side, maybe I'm going to make that a little bit darker. Hello in Spain! Welcome! What time is it in Spain right now? And thank you for tuning in. Yeah, the Stampin' Ink, uh, Stampin' Up! Ink should work. I mean, Stampin' Up! bought uh, Clear Snap, so I would imagine uh, Clear Snap is the uh, is the company that's making their inks because uh, I don't know. I, I can't think of another reason why they would purchase the, purchase them. Uh, they didn't change the name from Clear Snap though to Stampin' Up. They, it's called Clear Snap Holdings. Okay, it's, I don't know. It might be purchased by them, but it might be run as a separate entity. Okay, so there's that little cabin in there. See if I'm making that uh, the vertical edges darker like that. It looks a little bit more three dimensional. Now it, it kind of looks a little bit strange because. Uh, it doesn't have very much continuity with it at top. Let's go with this distressed walnut stain a little bit, okay? I don't like it. I like it different in terms of a little bit darker or a lot darker on the side, but I don't want it to have just, you know, no color on the top there. So I see, I put a little smearing of that color up there, okay? So that's where lighting comes into play. It just means don't color everything out. It's not a harder technique. It's just be a little bit more, uh, use your darker colors a little bit more sparingly, okay? Okay, now let's do something right here. Let's try a different hue in here. And let me see, I think I have a clean stylus tool. That looks really stained, but it should be clean. Let's use a different hue up there in the sky. One of the things I like to do is I like that kind of that kind of light violet tone that you see in the sky sometimes, like around dusk or dawn or whatnot. And I'll show you what that might look like. Um, here's a rosemary or a orchid. Okay, just go with any pale uh, pink that you might have, if you're doing this type of thing. Now I say that because I don't know if, I don't think this is going to go well. This is a really bright pink, right? We don't want that. Maybe this one's disintegrating too. A lot, a lot of my pads that are about 20 years old are starting to disintegrate. And they're kind of all doing it at that same time. But anyways, that color is way too bright. Okay, now this one might be too bright as well. Yeah, uh, going back to pads, one of the things that I would recommend is just... I, I really believe in, as far as pads go, 
Um, a lot of times in the past, I just, I don't like to say like the brand that I'm using. So I would say things like use a light pink here. And now I'm using a kind of a, you know, a, a pale blue or something like that. Then people would say, hey, what color is that that you're using? What brand, you know? So nowadays I'm just saying what I'm using. It's because I don't want people to get stuck and say, I can't do that scene because I don't have that particular color. And some people are like that, you know, they, they want the exact stuff you're using in a demonstration or whatnot. But I do like to mix and match. There are just certain colors that some companies have in certain lines. Okay. Let's see, I'm using that just in a very pale, almost dry brush application. Okay. That's down here in the water. But let's use some of that up in the sky. I'm being careful not to just tone out all of that light area up there. Okay. And it doesn't have to be a direct mirrored um, reflection of what's going on immediately above it, okay? But what I'm doing right here is I'm kind of creating this continuity now, even in a very pale form with all of these different um, lit areas. Okay, now my theory is, is that if the lighting is coming from the sky, okay, that color light is going to be shining on the various areas or objects that are being illuminated by that light. So if you have a sunset scene or something like that shining on the lake, I would probably make the lake the colors of the sky as opposed to doing it in blue. You could, but um, I, I usually don't. I usually do my objects in my scene as a kind of a reflection of a, you know whatever color lighting is in there. All right, so that is that. But now one of the things that I'd like to do too, to kind of finish off a scene in terms of the value scale, is whatever colors I stamp my main images in, in this case it was black, okay, the lakeside cabin was stamped in black, and the ledge down here was stamped in black, I like to finish off the other areas in here with black as well, okay? So let's go back to the black dye base pad, okay? And I think this same color will kind of contain the composition nicely and it creates a little bit of a vignette. And what I say in my other videos, what this does too, is if you take an area of your scene and make it darker. And I find that my corners of my scenes are very convenient areas to do that in because it doesn't have to make sense in terms of a shadow, okay? It's just a vignette around my composition. If you take those areas and make them one step darker, then your areas in your scene that are light will seem one step lighter by contrast. Any kind of dye based inks work pretty well. Some, the only difference between some dye based inks with certain color, uh, not compositions, but certain brands of inks, sometimes they dry somewhat dull looking, okay? But again, if you spray your scenes, um, it should bring back the vibrancy, or before your scene completely sets up and dries, spray them then. Okay. Now, those sprays are kind of stinky, and I don't know, there's probably some other types of, you know, more kind of environmentally sensitive ones than something like a Krylon, but uh, I don't know, you'll have to look at that. Um, there's that, Judikins has that kind of wax sealant that works pretty good, too. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of the paper combinations, it's best to kind of experiment around. Now, those Marvy ones are the ones that I find don't um, they don't really dull as much as the other brands. And I have a feeling that, see, certain brands, there's something in the binder with all of them that makes them thick, 
so that you know, it's for the simple reason of uh, you have these raised die base pads, and if these inks were any thinner, then that ink would just kind of it would sap you know seep out of the pad as opposed to being suspended in that material right there. So I have a feeling that whatever's making it a little bit thick could be the thing that when you look at a scene that's been glazed over and over with those inks, it could be the thing that kind of makes it dry a little bit dull, okay? But just spray them though and you'll be fine. Uh, some people, this is way back in the day, I feel really old when I say that type of thing, but before um, all of this type of media and accessories were out there. Um, some people would just spray their scenes with uh, hairspray or their cards, you know, didn't have to be a scene or something like that, but they would, they would use hairspray. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to look like over time nowadays. People are so worried about kind of the archival aspect of uh, the different media out there, especially starting with scrapbooking, you know, we want these scrapbooks to last forever, but, um, you know, back in the day, we were just thinking about sending cards to someone, and, you know, want, you want it kind of sealed off and protected. And a lot of times, early on, too, is, uh, um, when people were stamping, a lot of people started off stamping, and they were doing um, letter art, so what they were doing, the scenes were the envelopes themselves. So there were a lot of mail art going around. And people would be spraying their, you know, their envelopes with that. Okay. Getting carried away here, but um, I've... I call it tipping the edges. I've made the edges a little bit darker. But do you see how going with that same color that you did in your um, imagery... I feel it kind of, there's a more of a cohesiveness to the overall now, I feel, okay? But now let's go to this le, uh, this read stamp down here. Now I was mentioning that most of the times, as in a case like this, I like to reserve those foreground image impressions for when I'm done, okay? Done coloring, I should say. So now I can see how this looks like here in the foreground, okay? Let me show you this too, okay? This is how you can get a lot more variation out of your imagery, okay? So we have this ledge down here, and let's say we have these two images, okay? And we'll use them together with each other, okay? Adding it in the foreground. All right. But that being said, if it's added to the foreground like that, you can you can layer your foreground imagery further. Okay. Hey, there's someone that remembers the hairspray sealant. You must be a long time stamper. Take your ledge stamp right here and mask off that ledge, okay? And now let's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like sandwiching your ledge stamp in some grass from these foreground grasses like that, okay? See that right there? Okay, and let's find out we do the same thing over here. Uh, I believe you will be able to watch this again. I think I've done some test videos so far. I don't even know how live streaming works sometimes. I, I was I wasn't even quite sure that I was on when I clicked on the uh, the live here. But um, um, I think when we're done, I think what it does is it has to um, the live streams has have to process, and then after it processes, I think it just goes. It just gets entered into the uh, the channel again. So uh, yeah, you should be able to watch it again. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think the chat is available though. I think it's just the video that's going. Um, but anyways, here we've sand sandwiched that in there, and I could 
you could mask off areas of this rock as well, okay? And you can have grass growing out from the cracks of the rock. Hey, thanks for tuning in, Gail. Okay, here's some more right here. So you can really give a lot of variation, okay? And when you're doing things like that, okay, when you're layering things, like these images like that, you can really, really extend the usage of that imagery out to a much larger composition, or from composition to composition, you can have these two stamps that you've used, and it'll never look like the same thing. And plus, when you do things like this, over the top of an image that has been used in repetition, okay? Now, it should blend in seamlessly with itself inherently, but when you do things like that, it blends in even more, okay? And then, like I said again, you know, uh, well, I've said it in other videos, but um, scenic stamping is really, it, rubber stamps are really fantastic for this because, you know, in nature, there is a lot of repetition that's, that you find out there. You see, you know, a whole forest of trees. I mean, I could take one tree stamp in theory and stamp it out 50 times or whatnot, and I can create an entire forest from it, and it wouldn't look too weird, you know. And uh, things like these grasses down there, you know, it, it's hard to see where one impression of it starts and, you know, another one begins, or where one ends and the other one begins, just because of the angle that you use it at, and the height of it, and the placement of it, okay? All right, so that is a card. You can do other things, too. Like I said, you, if you want to put some little figurine in here and stamp it in here, you can do something like that. I could put stars up in the sky or any of, any of those other, other types of embellishments that I usually do on my scenes that I think pushes the scene even further in terms of a kind of a resolution or a finish to it. One of the things that's kind of hard to avoid in like a cabin like that is working around that little window in there. But I could take a, like a white pen and I could make it look like, um, you know, that area in there is a little bit more illuminated by recovering some of the white of it. And then I could put that reflection down here. So that's really fun to do. Um, but let's move on to a different composition now. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's do something with um, this country chapel or some of the filler stamps on it, maybe. We've done two kind of water compositions. And let's see, here's the insert for this one right here. Here's the country chapel set. We've done water. Now let's do something with some grassy textures and land, but we can see on this insert here where, you know, I've used, going back to the idea of, you know, the repetition of form and using a certain image many, multiple times for different purposes and, you know, a reflection on depth uh, within a scene. Let's do something like that here in a stamp sketching piece. Okay. All right. All right, I really need to keep my keep track of my black pad here. All right, hmm. Let's do, so uh, okay, well, let's just do something around that entire uh, country chapel. I need a big composition, I mean, not composition, a big uh, block here. Okay, now here's one of the things that someone has asked me before, and that's what do you, how do you condition your stamp here um, when it's brand new to uh, receive ink? Now, sometimes you start inking up, and it depends on the brand of ink, too. Some of them are a little bit thicker, like I said, so sometimes it kind of puddles up. So one of the things, this is the simple thing I do with a brand new stamp. I just kind of rub it like this with my hand. I mean, you can do other things. You can do... Uh, um, you know, blot it off on a wet paper towel or something like that. Or you can take a, 
you know, a washcloth or something like that and rub it. Because sometimes what happens with stamps with a lot of surface area is that when they press rubber, there's this spray that they spray into the mold so that, you know, the rubber comes out nice and clean, but sometimes that can resist ink a little bit. I, I don't find that's the problem, you know, that happens too often, but this image right here, this country chapel, has a lot of surface area on it. Now, if anyone's familiar with, like, uh, uh, with posh impressions, their stamps were really bold and solid. Okay, now she recommended, I think she recommended, it might have been like something like a super fine grit sandpaper. I don't know if that was the case with her, but I know people used to do that, and it made me cringe, you know, thinking about taking, you know, sandpaper, no, no matter how fine it was, and kind of using it on there. But hey, I don't know, it worked for them, but I would never recommend something like that. And you can almost tell, too, sometimes, like, this Marvy ink goes on there just fine, but maybe with a thicker brand, if you didn't rub it, you know, a little bit, it might be pooling up and you can see it, and it might not give you a good initial first impression. Now, let's see if this one gives me a good first initial impression. I might have to go with my, my second one or something like that, or third, but let's see just how this one takes. I, I hope I don't have to do that, um, again, because I'm lazy and I don't want to have to ink that up again. Okay, plenty of center pressuring here. Uh, yes, the stamps are available in the United Kingdom. Uh, actually, we have our United Kingdom uh, distributor there, and you can find them under uh, stampscapes. Okay, I forgot what it was. Oh, no, you can just look them up. Just type in Stampscapes uh, UK or something like that, and they have their website there. Okay. Oh, good. It snapped out just fine. <laughs> and it, it, sometimes it doesn't, you know. If I don't rub them off a little bit, especially like like that spruce large or something like that, or this one too sometimes, uh, because it has so much surface area. It's the stamps that have a lot of surface area. Okay, so that is stamped out. Now we need to fill in around it. Now this is what I used to do with my uh, classes. Um, I didn't do so much of the filler stamps with their first scenes, but what I used to have them do is pick out some kind of land element and some kind of sky element. They would stamp that land element in black, and they would stamp their sky element in whatever color they were going with uh, in terms of their first color scheme. So if it was something like a moonlit scene, I would just have them stamp out their moon in blue. They could stamp it out in black, too, but here's the Sedge filler stamp, okay? Now, just like my water stamp, where the water pattern is the binding kind of texture that, you know, you work around your different, um, that different area in there, okay? It creates continuity from edge to edge, in other words, okay? Same thing right in here. Same thing goes for this uh, sedge filler stamp, just general textures, okay? These general textures are the ones, the stamps that I use the most, okay? They're the most generic of all imagery, okay? All right? Now, again, when you're doing these filler images, okay? Now, see, I am running some of that texture up into that chapel image, okay? But it's so light that I don't feel that that little bit in those steps right there is an obtrusive type of mark, you know? It doesn't look strange, like, oh my god, some of the sedge filler went up in there. You know, it's not like that, okay? So light, even pressure, and I like to, I mean, I don't know if I need to re-ink in between every impression, but um, I am, just so it looks a little bit more uniform. Okay, now that's where that one ends right now. That's my horizon, but if I want to go higher, I can. Okay, if I want a background hill like this, I can do that. And I can, you know, connect it right up here too if I want to. But I'll leave a little bit of a gap there and I'll show you why.
Has anyone embossed these images before? That's one thing that I haven't played around with enough uh, ever, and I'm going to start doing that at some point in time. Because there's a lot of possibilities there. It's kind of one of those things, you know, I've been mostly working in, you know, two-dimensionally. And at one point in time, I started doing a little bit of experimentation with things like, um, I think it's called reindeer moss, you know, where I was doing these like shadow boxes and stamping a scene out and having things like that reindeer moss in the foreground, okay? I had it in the shadow box because it looks kind of strange, just kind of, you know, pasted down here or something like that. So you had to kind of have it in a setting or like dried um, flowers or, you know, those, th those dried thing, you know, whatever, little branches and things like that you can find in a, you know, a craft store. These look pretty interesting, like, especially if you had, like, a scene like this and I put wildflowers down here in the foreground. It was kind of interesting to have some of that three-dimensional aspect to it. But going back to the, uh, the embossing, um, you know, that's actually three-dimensional, three dimensional, right? Because it's raised. And I thought, I've always thought that that's something that, where I haven't seen a lot of that explored at this point in time. Okay, so here's some trees in the background. And I'm just using the tops of them right here, okay? Maybe where that one little hill is, you know, we can have some rolling hills in the background. So I can place something like this. Yeah, it, like embossed branches look really fantastic. Like I did these three videos yesterday, like something like that. But I mean, I think that branch right there would look really awesome embossed over this, you know, this black cardstock. And, I don't know, there's just uh, silver embossing would have looked really cool for that branch, or uh, like holiday cards, and, I don't know, that opens up an entirely new kind of world. You like that one, Natalia? Check out uh, the, the, those three videos that I did yesterday. I'm just kind of tapping into... Uh, I'm trying to figure out what makes these ones, uh, these looks here, click. Okay, now this one right here was kind of a, <laughs> a bit of a breakthrough for me. I put down a ton of that white pigment ink in there, and I thought that one brought that together. But um, I'm trying to figure out what the key thing that makes this kind of this white pigment ink on black cardstock work. And that one that I just showed you right there, I, I wasn't quite sure what that was going, you know, the direction that was headed in for a long time until I added in that fog. But um, I love that one too. Um, that last one. I, I like all of them that I did yesterday. I got, kind of got obsessed and I stamped out uh, three of those cards and I did three lessons in that yesterday. But anyways, repetition of form, right? Okay, we have these trees and it's the same tree. But here it is, what is it? One, two, three, four, five impressions, okay? There's five impressions with that same tree, so you can really get a lot of mileage out of it, okay? And what is the thing that's kind of bringing all of this, all of these different images together? And it's the sedge filler. It's the one, it's the most kind of, uh, I don't know, generic of all the images, but it's the thing that brings it all together and it ties everything together. And again, I mean, here's the extent of my masking right there. It's just a paper towel, okay? Now, one, sometimes, once in a while, this is one of those things where you'd have to do a little bit more careful masking as if you had something right behind that steeple there because it's sticking up right there. And if I have a moon behind there or something, I don't need to mask off those trees, but, you know, you might have to mask off the that little steeple like that and just, you know, stamp something in the background like so. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else we can do on this thing from a compositional standpoint. Oh, that might be interesting. We could add some foreground or something like that. You can use those reeds in here again, and it would put someone really close, you know, the viewer, 
closer into some object in there. But um, this is what I do uh, in terms of the lighting for a scene like this. Let me show you. Let me show you something really fast. I was thinking. I don't know if I want to take you guys through like the entire process of doing like a green meadow and blue sky up there or something like that. But let's talk about lighting again, okay? And um, let me show you what I do from a lighting standpoint. Okay. Now, sometimes the reason why I say that is sometimes um, when I've seen people from like convention to convention, okay, you know, I did a demonstration or something like that for them um, one year. And they, people, you know, they, they catch on to the compositional um, aspect of scene stamping very quickly, okay? It's just kind of breaking out of that um, habit of really careful placement, um, stamp positioners, masking, post-it note, masks, and all that, you know. That, they, people don't have a problem kind of getting rid of it. Like I said, it's sometimes it's liberating for them um, to do that. But where they kind of run into some questions periodically from time to time, <clears throat> in terms of the questions I get, is when it comes to lighting. Actually, it's not really a question. They just say, you know, what I still haven't gotten is the lighting, okay? Okay, now let's just do this with gray, okay? I'm just going to do a grayscale scene right here. But let's just not think about it in terms of the hue. Let's think about it in terms of um, the values, okay? Now, it doesn't really matter what you have illuminated in here. Now, chances are I'd probably want that chapel to be illuminated. I, I don't think I want that just to be in this darkness. I mean, it, it is kind of the subject matter of the scene here, okay? But one of the things that I start doing Okay, now I'm just going to go on with the memento because it blends so beautifully and easy. Um, in my skies, remember that thing about the edges? Okay, the four corners, I should say. Not the edges, but the four corners especially. I like to darken in my edges, okay? Now, sometimes I think about lighting a little bit more than I do here, but usually not. It's usually this. Okay, now, at the base of trees and the base of objects, okay, I usually put a shadow down there, okay? So, here's my chapel. And when you put a shadow at the base of something, I feel that it looks like it's sitting into the scene more than it did before I put that in. It kind of anchors it, and you're saying that that object, there's, it's solid and it's opaque, okay, being that it's casting that shadow, okay? Now the trees are also doing that, so I'll put a little bit of a sh uh, shadow at the base of the tree. You don't have to do that for all of the trees, but just in general I usually do it a little bit. Okay, we can kind of already start to see a lighting scheme coming around, and we've really barely done anything, right? Okay. But the trick is, again, is just in the retention of those light areas. Okay, so I have a little bit of it in the sky, and we'll put some of it down here, maybe in the meadow. But for the most part, that lighting scheme is established. Okay, we have a little bit of light up here on that uh, hill, going into the distance. And now, let's look at this country chapel image, okay? Here's the printout of this, but we can see where the shadows are on the chapel, right? In the image itself. Well, what you do is you just go in and you reiterate what you have on the image, okay? So that's kind of my head start, you know. I just look at the imagery and I figure out what's a little bit darker on that. So there that is, okay? And at some point in time, now see, the more of this gray that I add, the darker it gets. But as soon as it reaches its full saturation of that given hue, it's just not gonna get any darker, okay? If you're working with a light gray, it's only only going to be as much of a light gray in terms of its value scale, okay? So when I see 
that is just not getting any darker using that given hue, okay, that's when I can move to a darker color. You know, if I was working in greens down here, I'd work in darker green, I'd start off with a light green or something like that. Okay, but we're just doing this kind of in a monochromatic um, color scheme right here, or value range. Okay, that was the Memento London Fog. All right, now let's go to this number 12 gray. The number 12 gray from Marvy is barely darker than that uh, Memento one, so I don't know if this is really going to be uh, beneficial or not. Okay. But we'll test it out. Now I'm just using, I haven't cleaned off my uh, applicator. If I'm working in the same kind of color family, I just stay with that color. Or I just stay with that tip there. Okay? I figure that having some of that existing color in there, and then when I move up into a darker value, it's some combination of the two. So it's really not, you're just not using straight gray, you're using gray with a little bit of London Fog, and the more you use this, the more it transitions into that uh, current color. So that's where the blending comes into play. It happens very easy. You don't need to keep cleaning your tip off in between um, colors. Now if I'm going from something like a red and I don't have another tip and I want to use yellow on there or something like that, I'm going to, you know, clean it off and then use it. Okay, but you can see, here's two colors here, and that's a pretty decent, you know, um, lighting scheme in here. It looks kind of silvery. There's a kind of a, I don't know, airy feel to it. It would look really great with some pigment ink applications in here. Now, if you want to tint it or something like this, one of the things that I did fairly recently was um, I did black in here, then I did a little touch of um, hue, okay, it's like a, um, yeah, I, think, I, I don't know what they call it, colorizing or whatever, not like colorizing of like a black and white movie or something like that, but you know those photographic tints back in the day, uh, you don't find them and there's actually, there's no more camera stores it seems these days, but um, I used to see these tints and they were all very light, okay. And it's when people would color their black and white photos. So kind of in that same spirit, you can do something like that with a grayscale um, value scheme. I guess it's not a color scheme because gray is not a color or a hue. But um, here we go here. And here we go again, okay? Um, as far as lighting goes, and people defining lighting, it's really for them. When I when I know it happens, um, when they're having troubles with lighting, it's because when they take, move into those darker tones, they're taking that color in too far, and then they've lost the things that they've um, kept light with the lighter colors that they've applied. Okay, so when you move into the darker ones and medium ones just kind of stay out of those areas in general. Uh, am I going to be doing some more winter card scenes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of weird, you know, I'm starting to go out and walk into these stores these days, and uh, they already have the, uh, the Christmas uh, decorations out, especially Costco, who always has it out like five months in advance, you know. They're probably selling Easter eggs now or something. But... Um, yeah, absolutely. Now, when I think about Christmas scenes, a lot of times for me, I'm thinking of holiday, like, uh, I think more seasonal because I don't have, like, winter imagery in the landscape, so I don't have, like, a Santa Claus or something like that, or a Christmas tree. But one of the things that I want to do is when I was doing this look right here, I want to do... <laughs> the next one that I do is I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, like, draping from... Um, and that's why I broke out my... Uh, my French curves right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of create some draping between some of these branches like this. Okay? It's going to be like a string of lights throughout. I don't know if it's going to be this exact spooky branch here, right? but it, it seems like prime for it. But 
instead of doing these um, stars up there, like these glowing stars, I'm going to do the, these Christmas uh, lights hanging between some branches, or I'm going to have it doing uh, hanging between um, like this right here, like some, I don't know, like, you know, can you imagine some kind of Christmas lights? It's kind of an unconventional use of, uh, you know, like Christmas lighting, but wouldn't that look kind of cool to have these kind of like glowing lights, you know, on a string between these? And I think it would make for an interesting card. And one of the other things I was thinking about doing too was I thought about this scene right here. And I'm going to get do a scene like this again, not with that scene right there. But can you mention um, pumpkins down here? I mean, I think that would look really cool as far as a Halloween card. But pumpkins or something like that. Oh, I have this uh, kind of this dancing skeleton that I could have put here in the background. So instead of between every two pines as a doorway to a new world, I'm going to put a dancing skeleton. So instead of, uh, you know, whatever nature scene, it's a, you know, Halloween card. So that's going back to kind of my initial comments of stampscapes being kind of background stamps for other types of subject matter. Whatever subject matter you put in any type of scene, it could be an 11 by 17 scene, okay? It could be this beautiful forest or something like that. But if I put like a little, you know, little tombstone down here, you know, with a little, you know, pumpkin next to it, it's a Halloween, you know, scene all of a sudden. So that's what's good about kind of the universal aspect of nature stamping, okay? All right. So uh, let's take this. And let's let's add a little bit of tone onto it. Let's have some uh, color fun on that. Now this is one of the things too. On a recent um, lesson, I did that grayscale tinting video lesson, and it's about kind of creating a value, a full scene with a fully defined range of values. Okay. And instead of building up the colors from the beginning, like this one, you know, like working from light blue, medium blue, darker blue, you know, other colors in here, it's just doing this grayscale background in there, establishing the lighting scheme, okay? And it's really easy to do when you do something like that, okay? Um, because you're not really having to think about colors, so you've established your lighting scheme in here, but now, what you're going to do, or what you can do in this type of uh, process right, right here, is you're going to take some of your lighter tones, okay? I wouldn't go with, now, see, if I'm going to create this grassy area down here, I'm not thinking dark green, okay? I'm thinking something lighter, because I'd rather build it up, okay? Because I, I can see it happen nice and slowly. Because sometimes it's hard to tell what's going to happen, okay? This, that happens for me all the time. I'm constantly in a state of uh, really kind of... I mean, I can expect some things, you know, just from experience. But a lot of times, you know, I'm still kind of experimenting around with things. And I want to see what it's going to look like, okay? This is that Distress Ink. Um, this one is the Healed Paint. Love that color. Sometimes I try to achieve this color with use of other tones, okay, and I mix them, but the dressing is just kind of inherently out of the, out of the pad, kind of a nice, rich, um, kind of earthy green, okay, but now see, here's what I'm doing, I'm tinting this down here, but again, if I want to retain some of that lightness, it just means don't go over it too much, I could get a little bit of color in there, but if you want to retain that lighting scheme, okay, I wouldn't go over the whole thing, okay? Now, that looks pretty good to me in terms of the, that tint. It has kind of an aged look, I guess. And in that uh, video that I did recently on grayscale tinting, of this sort. I mentioned it's kind of this thing they used to do. Uh, painters, it's called Trompe which I think uh, 
translated it into fool the I, but um, it's just going in here and adding those lighter shades right over the top of it and building up those colors. So that is the peel paint. Let's go in here and let's try to add a little bit more of a rich, these things really hold a lot of ink. Um, let's take that out of there. Let's try some of this. Um, let's make it look even more earthy. Let's try some of this antique linen or tea dye in here. The reason for that is because I don't like that so bright, that little area of green, so I'm going to knock it down. Now that happens to me all the time. Sometimes I put black over the top of it just to subdue colors that seem kind of out of place or are too um, vivid and uh, bright. Okay, And browns and greens happen to work really well. Okay? And again, I'm being careful not to just tint everything out in terms of my lightness, okay? I might go into some of those lighter areas, but it's with a really dry application of that given ink, depending on how dark it is. Okay? okay, now, that looks pretty good, I think. That's tea dye, by the way. Ranger, if you're ever watching this, don't discontinue the distress inks. Which I don't think they would. I think they are doing just fine. But they, you know, they got rid of their Adirondack line. Okay, I'm putting a little of this on the chapel. Okay. Now, if I want to, I can give this scene kind of a more antique sepia, sepia. I always call it sepia, I don't know which one it's, I should look it up sometime, maybe it's pronounced both ways, but I can give this kind of this brown tone tinge to that sky as well, and that'll give it a more antique look, but if you want to see what this looks like just in terms of a, a multi-hue piece, let's just put some blue up there, okay? But, again, let's go with something nice and light. A lot of you are familiar with Memento. Let's try some of that. Let's go with the Summer Sky. And I take it into my darker areas first. In this case, it happens to be the corner. And I'll just kind of blend it in slowly, okay? It's super light, so it's just a tinge, actually. It looks more brown. Am I using the same side here? Yeah. Okay, this is turning that gray to a little bit of a cooler gray. It's so light, though. I think I need to move into maybe a salvia blue. Let's try the salvia blue. Okay. Blot it off a few times. And I'll take it into my darker area and add that. And I'll see that area turn a little bit bluish, okay, like so. I feel that these tones, when added to that grayscale, make that grayscale a little bit more rich, okay? And I mean, there's certainly temperature, there's cool, there's warm down here, but here's one of the things that I do too, okay? Just like I brought that pink into these various areas and objects to create that continuity, okay? I usually don't like it where my sky is cool, let's say if I'm doing blues, and my land is warm, all right? So what I do is I sneak these a little touch. And this is also why you retain, uh, well, well, why I retain some of that lighter area than just the pure white of the card so that I can bring some of that blue from up there down into this area, down into this terrain, okay? And I feel that, not that I want blue grass or something like that, but I just feel that it brings a little bit more continuity to the overall. And I had, I think I had some of that on my chapel as well, okay? And it's subtle for sure, 
But I, I have a feeling that when your viewer looks at the end result, even if they don't notice it, you know, right off the bat, I feel that there is an overall feeling of continuity between the different um, areas within a scene and the different subject matter, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to put something in everything, okay? But the more things that you kind of uh, create relationships in between, you know, potentially more continuity that you can have as an end result, all right? Um, let's see here. Really fun things to do if you've watched my videos before are the embellishments. Things like down here, I think everything is rich in terms of uh, value. We have lights and we have darks. We have temperature, we have cool and light. There's some areas that are a little bit more bright and some areas are a little bit more dull in terms of the colors, but texturally, um, this is a Uniball White Signo pen. Uh, which card was that, Dana? Dana said that uh, that card is her favorite. Was it one that I just mentioned? Okay. Now here's the thing, too. Um, with uh, these little clusters, I'm putting what would be maybe some of the, you know, like a wildflower, maybe pearly everlasting or something like that. You know, there's little white flowers in the meadow, but I'll tell you, and this includes me too, um, when I first started adding things like that, I don't know, there's something in us, I think, or most of us, or a lot of us, um, that wants to position these little dots perfectly spaced apart from one another. So it's like um, uh, like a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch apart. So I have to kind of remind myself to cluster these a little bit more, okay, like that. And it makes it a little more irregular, which I think, in, as far as the scene goes, makes it look a little bit more natural looking. Okay, now I wasn't going to get into this, but um, if you've seen any of my videos and uh, my response to some of the end results, I, I, get, I get this itch to finish them off. Okay, now especially since I've added in those little highlights like that. Color box pigment ink, okay. Frost white. This is not a brand new pad, so there's not a ton of ink in mine, but a lot of yours, you know, might be super juicy. So if you do this technique right here, what you want to do is you want to just gently tap a little bit of that ink into the tip right there. Kind of get a feeling of uh, how much you're applying. Now my pad is, my ink pad is really dry, okay, so that not very much is on there. All right, let me see what I'm looking at here. I'm scrolling on my computers to see if I can see the scene via my chat window. And uh, the uh, scene, my live action scene is a little bit um, delayed and higher. Okay. I hope, I hope this isn't within the field of view. <laughs> um, okay, fog and mist, okay? I love this look in scenes. I mean, it was really... I mean, you can see, it, it, it even works on black paper, surprisingly. I don't know, I thought it would stand out too much, but I thought it looked really cool on this. Um, I should do one of those live. Not on this session right here, because I'm probably going to run out of videos and card space, but um, uh, this really can add a nice atmosphere. I can't tell you, I, there are so many scenes that I've done in demonstrations, in, in I'm sure some of the uh, 
the video lessons that I've done where I feel that this technique here kind of saves a scene. I mean, scenes look okay without it, but um, just that little bit in there can, and it just, it extends instantly the range of texture in a given composition instantly, okay? But the thing is, here's what you don't want. Here's what people get when they first start doing this, okay? They get that right there, okay? And it's kind of, it's, it's understandable too, because this is a kind of a new technique, but you just want to build things up slowly, okay? Now what I do is I just kind of get it going like this. And like I said, um, my pad is really, really dry, so a few taps like that, and that's all I'm getting. But you can also get that even if you have a lot of ink on your pad. Just don't take in as much and blot it off a lot before you start going on there. Now one of the, the feeling of this though is when I do like a couple taps, I can't see anything at all. Like there's, it's so dry on this that if I do one tap, nothing, okay? And it's only through about 10 taps or so, light taps at that, do I start to see something. And then I start to build it up like so. Okay, it kind of, it's an extra, it's an extra texture, and it represents lighting as well, okay? And it just is that extra little touch to bring an added continuity to all of the different areas and objects within a scene, and it reinforces your lighting as well, okay? So if the lighting is coming from here, if I put a little bit of this um, pigment ink on the side of these trees that are facing that light, I feel that it kind of illuminates them a little bit. Uh-oh, I'm not sure if this camera is focusing. I remember when I had the HDMI, it might be kind of locked in in terms of the focus. So um, I don't know, if I've been showing this like this and it's been out of focus the whole video, I apologize. But, um, anyways, hope you can see that. Let me see if I can see a little bit more there. Okay. Is that out of focus? It seems like it's not focusing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Apologize if there's any focusing issues here. I have it set on autofocus, but I'm not sure what it's doing. Okay, so anyways, bringing that in there. Kind of bringing it around like that. Okay. Now let's do something with this one too, okay? Looks fine as is, but let's say here's this lighting in the background. And just on those trees, kind of facing that light, or in the light, I can kind of obscure them a little bit with a little bit of this ink. And hopefully it looks like the light is hitting those trees in those areas. And we've all seen some bodies of water at some point in time where there's kind of mist rising off the surface. And isn't that always a cool look? Well, you can have that look if you want in every scene that you do. And one of the things that, that I kind of... Um, I, I have a theory about these scenes, scene stamping, when people do them, is that when we do them, one of the cool things about it is because it, it's an actual scene or a location that we're creating, I, I think we kind of escape into that scene in some way, visually, for a little bit of time. So you can kind of create these landscapes that you would like to be in or see, you know. So I, this, I don't know, I stamp out the types of scenes where uh, I think it'd be really cool looking at. Sometimes they're stormy and stuff like that, and I might not want to be out in the open, but I think it'd be cool looking from behind a, a window at these, uh, at these uh, sites, okay? So anyways, I'm adding that in the background there, adding it right along the, the water's edge. And if you want to, I mean, you can even add it into the foreground or something like that. Let's say there's a little bit of mist right here, close to us.
I remember when I was in college and I was walking back after a late night. Uh, I think I had a photography class that was really late at night, but um, look at that Long Beach State. You might have to walk a mile to your car after the end of the day, but I was at nighttime and I was walking next to the football practice field and there was this long sidewalk and, you know, it was illuminated by the uh, lighting, but it was this um, kind of a thick fog about a hovering about a foot off the ground that was really a cool kind of a looking uh, visual, you know. So it's like things like that, you know, that I always remember. Um, and that's what you can do in your scenes. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Oh, wow, we're at two hours here on this live video. broadcast and that's what I had this one set for. If anyone has any kind of thing they want to see or if anyone has any questions let me know. Otherwise this will conclude this first live broadcast of Stampscaping 101. I thank you for tuning in and checking it out. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I was able to teach you something, or I hope it was just fun to uh, watch. But um, I don't know. I love doing scenes. I loved hearing uh, all of those different comments as far as the, uh, the inks and what went. I think it was good that we can kind of, uh, if someone had a question, you know, I have other people to answer those types of questions that I don't know about. But I'm definitely going to have to look into that distress oxide. I've heard about those. You know, months passed, but then I kind of forgot about them, so I'm going to have to check them out uh, sometime and get them ordered and play around with them. But um, one of the things that I want to do some more, are, are, like I said, are those Christmas scenes or those winter scenes, and I definitely want to experiment more with those light on dark types of uh, cards, you know, which is a different type of process for me, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh, I can even do it in the same type of imagery that I did here in mean, this um, chapel here that looked really cool, I think, in uh, some sort of moonlit night type of uh, scene on dark paper stamped out in reverse. Those trees there would be white, you know, but um, anyways, fun stuff. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, if there's any comments uh, as far as things that you want to see in a future live broadcast, let me know. And I'll try to plan that and uh, get it set up for the next time we do this, okay? Anyways, thanks so much again. And signing off with the initial Stampscaping 101 Live. All right?